Belgrid Fortress, as seen from the Sava River, virgin of the Danube, is the ancient and modern centerpiece of Belgrid, Serbia. Belgrid, in most Slavic languages, means white city or white fortress. And yes, the fort does contain a dinosaur park. Because of its unique position on a hill between two rivers, it has been occupied continuously for well over 2,000 years for military and commercial use. And while the current structure was largely built during the period of mixed Austrian and Turkish rule, starting in the 18th century, it has gone through numerous forms from classical antiquity on through the Cold War. The fortress is for the most part of mixed use space for a park and a military museum. As you can see, the trenches between the Istanbul Gate or the Southern Gate were crossed leading into the older square of the fortress is home to numerous military vehicles and cannons, along with many great war artifacts. Many of them were captured by the Red Army and Yugoslavian partisans during the Second World War as Axis forces were retreating. There are several American vehicles on display, which I'm not entirely sure how they acquired, but it could have been related to some sort of Lend-Lease program with the Soviets during the conflict and somehow ended up in Belgrade, Serbia. I was quite impressed by the displays here. Um, I've never been this close up to this these many variants of tanks, cannons. Um, just walking around the fortress was interesting in and of itself, and uh, they certainly put a lot of work into this museum over the years. The original site of the fort, known then as the town of Sungundum, which I probably mispronounced, was first occupied by the Celts during the Gaelic invasion of the Balkans in the 4th century BC, largely driving the nomadic Scythians and Thracians people out. Uh, by 46 BC, the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire had conquered the area and further fortified the site as a formidable military outpost on the borderlands of the Empire. The area remained largely quiet until after the partition of the Roman Empire and it fell on the Byzantine side of the border. The fort was rebuilt by Emperor Justinian in 535 AD, and between this period and the 12th century, numerous Slavic tribes began settling the area which contested control of the town, and it finally came under the control of the newly formed Serbian state, and later Hungary, in 1427. In 1521, it came under the control of the Ottoman Turks until 1867. Between this time, there were numerous changes such as several decade, uh, decade rule by the Austrians and two Serbian revolts in the early 19th century. As we enter the military museum portion of the fortress, which paid admission is required, we see reconstructed artifacts and original artifacts from classical antiquity to early Turkish rule. Uh, this includes examples of some very early and rather ornate Ottoman wheel lock and flint lock long arms and pistols, no doubt status symbols for those who possess them as countless hours of craftsmanship were spent constructing and uh, really building them out. In 1817, Serbia gained self-rule as Turkish power in the Balkans began to recede, and by 1878, Serbia gained full independence from the Ottoman Empire. Right away, the newly recognized kingdom began importing large numbers of modern smokeless weapons, including the easily recognizable Mauser and a lot of variants of Mausers, with a mix of French and Russian arms since it was in military conflicts with its neighbor from the get-go. The landlocked country had several regional uh, challenges and goals, beginning with the formation of the Balkan League, which included Greece, Bulgaria, Montenegro... Uh, which basically had the goal of keeping the Austrians and Turks out of the Balkans. They also had a strong sense of national identity, which included protecting the Serbian nationals who lived outside of its national borders. As the Serbians become closer with the Western powers, you're going to see a lot more weapons from Britain, France, Russia appear in uh, Serbia's national uh, armory. Uh, as well as its defense forces. Um, you're still going to see a lot of Mausers in, in, scattered in here, but those are mostly going to be Spanish model Mausers. Um, things like Maxim guns, uh, belt bed machine guns, stuff like this is going to appear um, much more frequently as we get closer to the First World War. This, of course, culminates into a war with the Ottomans in 1912, and not soon enough in 1914, a Bosnian-Serb... Gaviril Princep of the Young Bosnians assassinated Austro-Hungarian Archduke Ferdinand. The assassination planned in a tavern here in Belgrade. 
Serbia received much of its military equipment from France, so it wouldn't be uncommon for soldiers to be wearing Adrian helmets and carrying Berthier rifles. It's also worth noting that Serbia suffered the largest casualty rate of World War I, with 28% of its population dying, a million and a quarter people. At the end of the First World War, the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes was proclaimed and thus became Yugoslavia. By the time World War II comes around, Yugoslavia rejects any advance by Nazi Germany to join the Axis powers, despite Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary doing so. In April 1941, Germany invades the country and Belgrade is bombed for three days straight, killing about 17,000 people. Uh, the army of Yugoslavia surrenders 11 days later, but the royal government leaves for exile in London to continue fighting. In occupied Yugoslavia, there was a simultaneous civil war between the communist partisans under Tito and Serbian royalist-leaning Chetniks led by Draza Milovic. Both sides amassed large amounts of stolen weapons from the Germans, used arms left over from previous wars, or made makeshift weapons from what they had. Things uh, were further complicated with Germany's occupation policy that was for every German soldier killed, 100 civilians would be shot in retaliation. The Chetniks believed... Generally speaking, engaging with the Germans would result in extreme loss of civilian life, while the communists really took the position that this was a, a necessary loss in order to fight uh, German occupation. You know, one of the big things for Yugoslavia during World War II was while the civil war was going on between the Chetniks and uh, various partisan groups, communists, royalists, etc., um, these groups regularly helped out downed Allied pilots who were usually flying routine bombing missions over Romania, which had a lot of oil fields that uh, Germany relied on. And many of the shot down pilots would were shot down over Yugoslavia on their return flights. Uh, one particular uh, story that was sort of uh, touched upon in a few of these exhibits at the museum uh, was told in the book, The Forgotten 500 by Gregory Freeman, on how 500 Allied pilots were being, uh, well, were helped out by Chetniks who came together through enemy territory under the risk of being captured, were able to construct a makeshift airstrip in the mountainside uh, without being detected by the Germans. Uh, this was under the cover of darkness, and they were eventually all evacuated when C-47s from Italy landed on this airstrip and got them out without losing a single person or aircraft. So many hundreds of Americans and British pilots certainly owe their, their lives to those partisans and uh, Yugoslavians who assisted them during the war. And this was this is uh, highlighted quite a bit in the United States history and relations with Yugoslavia during World War II. Uh, the rest of the museum is just uh, an outline uh, various weapons and the castle walls and uh, just kind of really neat to, to walk through everything. In the post-war era, obviously Tito's uh, communists were able to take control of the country um, until the fall of, well, Yugoslavia in the uh, 90s and early 2000s. So uh, if you're in Belgrade, certainly check out the museum. Uh, it's, it's worth spending a couple hours walking through.